Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. In this uh, brief session, we're going to take some time to look at another very commonly cited verse by our pre-tribulational brothers and sisters, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Uh, they often will cite this verse claiming that it supports a pre-tribulational rapture passage. So we're going to look at this, and in doing so, we're going to take some time to sort of untangle some confusing ideas uh, that have been imposed upon this verse, really imposed upon the, the overall sermon, which is often called the Olivet Discourse, because it was Jesus' sermon to his disciples about the end times on the Mount of Olives. So because it was on the Mount of Olives, again, this was just on the night before he was betrayed, um, it's called the Olivet Discourse. And there are a lot of very confusing ideas out there in the body of Christ uh, within academia concerning this sermon. And so we're going to take some time to sort of untangle that a bit and sort of untangle that knot and hopefully bring some clarity. So let's go ahead and just begin with Luke chapter 21, verse 36, and I'm going to read from the King James Version. We're going to look at a few different versions, uh, but I'm going to read from the King James because this is the version that's most often cited by our pre-tribulational brothers and sisters um, when they're citing it in support of a pre-trib rapture. Okay, so Jesus said, now again, this is in the context of a sermon about the end times. He says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus says, pray that you would be considered or counted worthy to escape all of these things. And by what are these things? All of the events of the last days. That you would be counted worthy to escape and to stand before the Son of Man. So the first problem uh, from the pre-tribulational perspective, is that this is part of the Olivet Discourse. You go, well, why does that matter? Because from a pre-tribulational dispensationalist interpretive perspective, the Olivet Discourse, the entire sermon that Jesus gave to his disciples about the end times, they will say, that's for the Jews. That's not for us. It doesn't apply to us. So, for example, in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, which we looked at last week, where it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, they will see the sign of the Son of Man in, in heavens. The sun goes dark, the moon turns blood. They see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And then it says they will see him coming in power and glory, right? And he will gather together his elect. And they go, no, that's, that's not about the rapture. It has nothing to do with the rapture. It has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with us. It doesn't apply to us. It applies to the Jews. Okay? And again, if you've never heard this perspective, you go, that's weird. Like, that's a really weird perspective. Now, there are clearly some very uh, geographic um, centered language. You know, he says, when you see all these things, flee those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains, etc. But it's not exclusively for Israel. So I understand that Jesus' emphasis is on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Um, he says, flee into the mountains of Judea. He doesn't, it's not universal. He's not saying, you know, if you live in Missouri or Arkansas, flee to the Ozarks. Or if you live in North Carolina, flee to the Smokies. Or if you live in Switzerland, flee to the Alps. He's not just saying general mountains. He's saying, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So I understand, to be clear, I understand the fact that it is a very geographic-centered uh, passage, it emphasizes the inhabitants of Jerusalem. On the other hand, in verse 9 of Matthew 24, it clearly says, Jesus says, and at that time you will be hated by all of the nations because of my name. So if anyone ever tells you this is for the Jews, i.e. the unbelieving Jews who all get saved after Jesus returns, I mean the overwhelming majority get saved after Jesus returns, when they look upon the one they have pierced, right, Zechariah 12 through 14, okay, if you say it's for the Jews, the problem is the nations don't hate Israel because of the name of Jesus. Again, Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus speaking to his disciples, his followers, he says, you will be hated in the last days, you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Why will the nations hate the recipients of the Olivet Discourse, because of the name of Jesus. 
Okay, so again, we've addressed this in previous uh, sessions, but the point is this. If anyone tells you the Olivet Discourse is just for the Jews and not for us, it's ridiculous. Pay no attention to them. It doesn't make sense. It's rooted in sort of other theological ideas that are not supportable, etc., etc. Now, here in Luke 21, it's also the Olivet Discourse. So isn't it ironic that they would say the Olivet Discourse is for the Jews, not for us? Oh, but wait, wait, there's a rapture passage over here in the Olivet Discourse. That's for us. That's contradictory. It doesn't work. So even from a dispensationalist perspective, this really should not be a rapture passage. However, and I don't want to make the whole session about this issue, but there's another very confusing idea that's very popular in the body of Christ. And so our pre-tribulational dispensationalist brothers and sisters, they embrace these ideas because it gives them uh, this particular verse back, so to speak. And what they'll say is they'll say, well, Luke 21 is largely about 70 AD. It's partially about 70 AD. It's partially about the future. But Matthew 24, it's all about the future. Mark 13, all about the future. Okay, so the Olivet Discourse, all about the future. But in Luke, it's kind of not talking about the future. It's talking about the past. Okay, now, where does this idea come from? It comes largely, again, just from academia. Um, various, you know, sort of biblical scholars have claimed this. I'll just say this, guys. Sometimes scholarship brings fog. It's called the fog of scholarship. You think the smart guys would bring more clarity, but oftentimes they bring more confusion. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching. I wanted to bring you this important message though. As many of you are aware, the Lord has been doing a tremendous work in the global South over the last, let's say 30 plus years. And now we're to the point uh, where the Lord has prepared a whole slew of workers. Uh, particularly from the Latino world, who are who are desiring to go to the ends of the earth, to the remaining unreached people, predominantly in the Middle East, to to re to to go after them with the gospel, and they're passionate for the Lord. They care about Israel. They care about the lost. The one thing they lack is they lack funding, and they really lack the capacity within their home culture, in most cases, to do an adequate job of funding the work that they feel called to go and do. And that's where we come in. We can help them to complete the task that they feel so committed and connected to in terms of uh, reaching the lost, reaching the remaining unreached people that remain in the world. So you can help to join our mobilization initiative, and you can find that at faistudios.org. So go and check that out, and be a crit it's a critical way that you can join us in doing the Lord's work in the 1040 window. Back to the teaching. Please hear me on this. And again, I'm, I don't want to make the whole session about this, but let me just say something. Use your common sense. Please listen. Bear me out. Hear me out here. There was only one sermon that was given the night that Jesus was betrayed on the Mount of Olives. You can lay Matthew 24 and Luke 21 right next to each other. It's clearly the same sermon. Yes, it's quoted a little bit different here and there. As always, people give different their angle, their perspective. But it's the same sermon. You can't say, well, the version in Matthew 24, Jesus was talking about the end times, but in the exact same sermon as recorded by a different gospel, that's talking about a whole different subject. That doesn't make any sense. What you would have to say is that Jesus gave two sermons side by side, back to back, that are almost identical, and one is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, and the other is recorded in Matthew, and that's bizarre. Like, that does not make any sense. So, again, part of my sort of um, view, and I'll stand by and defend this any day, is that Luke 21 is entirely talking about the future. Why do people say it's talking about the past? Because it says this. Here's the difference between Luke 21 and Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation sitting where it should not be in the holy place, then flee to the mountains. He says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation, flee to the mountains. In Luke 21, it's a little bit different. He says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near, flee to the mountains. And so what people have done is they've looked at that and they've said, well, clearly, clearly, you know, because 
I see this as talking about 70 AD. It must be talking about 70 AD. The problem is they're both the same sermon. They're both the same sermon. Jesus is talking about the same thing. And let me just point this out, which I point this out in one of my books. Um, I can't remember which one. It might be it might be Mideast Beast or When a Jew Rules the World. But if you say that Luke 21 was talking about 70 AD, then you, what you're saying is that Jesus gave the most horrible, horrific, really bad advice that you could give. Because the bottom line is, if the inhabitants of Jerusalem waited until Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, then it was too late. They, if you read in Josephus, he actually records, he, he tells the horror in the story, the wars, in the, the book, The Wars of the Jews, he tells the story of how once the city was surrounded by armies, many people tried to flee, and it says they would actually eat their silver and gold with the idea that they would, you know, fish it out later. And so it actually says that the Roman soldiers, the Arabs and the Syrians, Josephus calls them, it says that they would capture people that were trying to sneak out of the city, the deserters, and they would dissect them and cut their bellies open and fish through their intestines to pull out the silver and gold. The point is they, were, they got killed. Okay, So if Jesus said, you wait until the city's surrounded by armies, because when you look historically, when Titus was making his way down to Jerusalem, it unfolded over a few years. Right? He's up north, he's taking one city, he's slow, slowly making his way down to the south. If Jesus was giving advice about 70 AD, he would have said, when you see the armies coming from the north, get out, flee. You don't wait until the city's surrounded by armies. That would be horrible advice. And I challenge anyone using historical documents who are preterists to, to try to argue with me over this. If we take Josephus Josephus's history um, seriously, then you go, no, that would have been horrible, horrible, horrible advice. When Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, that coincides with Jerusalem being invaded by the armies of the Antichrist. It's the same sermon. It's talking about the same thing. So oftentimes we look at a passage and we go, well, that looks to me like, and that's not how you interpret the Bible. It's not, well, I see it this way. You go, well, I see it this way, but many others see it this way. And then you have to reason through it and think through it. It's not just because I feel like it should be. That's not how we interpret the Bible. Okay, so this is part of the Olivet Discourse. It's talking about the future. And our pre-tribulational dispensationalist brothers and sisters would say, the Olivet Discourse is for the Jews. It's not for us. So this verse, again, pray that you would be counted worthy to escape. That's for the Jews. And it has nothing to do with the rapture. Again, according to their argumentation, I don't believe that. I believe it's for us, but I don't believe it's talking about a rapture. Okay, so that's the first point. The uh, second point is, as always, you have to look at the text. So let's just actually take some time to look at the text. First, we're just going to compare a couple other translations, which is the CSB and the NASB, just focusing in on the key part. In the CSB, Jesus says, be on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength. Praying that you may have strength to escape all these things. Likewise, the NASB says, praying that you may have strength. The New King James Version, by the way, maintains the King James Version of pray that you would be counted worthy. Pray that you would be counted worthy. So the word there in the Greek, in terms of being counted worthy or having strength, it's katischio in the Greek. The definition is to be completely capable of doing or experiencing something. To be completely able to be fully able. Katischio. Okay, so the Greek word there means pray that you'll be fully capable, that you'll be able to escape. Now, again, just from a basic gospel perspective, is being saved something that you need to be capable or strong enough to be saved, or is it something that you receive by faith, right? As Protestants in particular, if you're a Protestant watching this, we fully believe that salvation is by grace through faith, and it's not by works. You're not saved by works. And the rapture, okay, is for everyone, okay? So there's some people out there that believe only the hardcore will be raptured, and all of the lukewarm Christians will be left behind, and this type of thing. 
That simply cannot be supported biblically, which we'll touch on in a moment. But the point is this. Being raptured is not something that you need to be strong enough for. You just need to be in Christ. You need to have the Holy Spirit in you because the rapture is simply the resurrection for those who are still alive. It's not really a resurrection because a resurrection is being raised from the dead. The rapture is just the transformation from a living body into an eternal living immortal body. Okay? You don't need strength for that. You don't you just need to be saved. Okay? We'll we'll kind of get into that some more. Now, from a pre-trib perspective, this verse is exhorting us to pray that we will be worthy or strong enough to be raptured. There's no way you can get around it. That's what the verse says. And that conflicts with basic Protestant theology, basic Christian theology. Salvation is by grace through faith. We are raised or resurrected if we are saved, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, not if we're strong enough, if we're hardcore enough. It's not based on anything in us. It's based on his grace and his spirit living and dwelling in us. Now, the post-tribulational or the pre-wrath perspective says the verse is exhorting us. Now, ready? This is my interpretation, and I would argue that in context, it makes complete, absolute sense. It's to pray that we would be strong enough, that we would have enough moral fiber and resolution in our hearts to make it through the tribulation with our salvation, with our souls intact, without denying Christ. Pray that you would be strong enough to escape, to come out the other side of the tribulation without denying Christ and losing your life, losing your eternal life, losing your soul. The pre-trib position says that we should pray all the time that we would be strong enough to be raptured. The post-trib perspective says we should pray all the time that we would be strong enough to survive, to endure, and to pass the test, and to escape this thing with our eternal life and with our souls. Which one makes more sense? I'm just going to go ahead and read a quote here from um, everyone's favorite old radio preacher, J. Vernon McGee. And he really was a fantastic Bible teacher, by the way. I used to listen to him for years when I uh, would paint every day. Look what, it, look what J. Vernon McGee says. He says, how are you going to be worthy? And now again, he's a pre-tribber. So this is a pre-tribber, a good pre-trib brother who's trying to make sense of his interpretation, but it doesn't really work. He says, how are you going to be worthy? The only thing that will make me worthy is my position in Christ. He's right. Therefore, I have trusted him as my savior and I have committed my way to him so that if I am alive at the time of the rapture, I'm going to meet him in the air by the grace of God. So he states what is true. He goes, you can't be worthy. How can you be worthy? But he never answers it. How can you be strong enough to be raptured? He never answers it. He says, look, the only thing you need to be raptured is to be in Christ. And he's absolutely right. But the problem is the verse says, pray that you would be strong enough. That is what the verse says. Now, as I said, everyone's raptured, right? It's not just, so for those out there that believe in a partial rapture, that believe only the hardcore will be raptured, the most elite, you know, you and your friends will be raptured, and all the other, the church up the street, they'll all get left behind, that type of view. It's not biblical. You can't support it biblically. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52? Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians. He says, we won't all sleep, but we will all be changed. Not just the hardcore. Not just the hardcore will be raptured in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. He says, all. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to FAIstudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. So there's no basis for a partial rapture in scripture, okay? Therefore, the idea that we need to pray that we would be found worthy to be raptured, it simply cannot be supported biblically. 
Number three is we simply need to look at the surrounding context. As always, step out, zoom out a little bit, and read the larger context. So I'm going to read here from the NASB, but I'm going to begin in verse 34. Jesus says, be on the guard. Ready? So that your hearts won't be weighed down with the dissipation or drunkenness, the, the being drunk with the cares of this world and, and all of the, the um, intertangling uh, temptations of this world. He says, pray that your hearts won't be weighed down and bogged down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. It's very similar to Jesus's parable of the sower. He goes, you know, some, some people here, they accept the word, they receive it, but they don't have deep roots because it was on rocky soil. And then when the heat comes, when the trials, the tribulations of this life or the cares of this world, the worries of this life come, they fall away. He's, he's referring to all of the challenges to our faith of this life. And he goes, be careful because when that day comes, your hearts might be really backslidden. It's basically what he's saying. And that day will come on you like a trap. You won't be ready. Now, Jesus, again, from, a, from a, the perspective of our pre-trib brothers and sisters, they say, this is for us. This is for us. That day will come upon you like a trap if you're a little backslidden. Either you're saved or you're not. But being backslidden a little bit doesn't mean that you'll miss the rapture. Because as Paul said elsewhere, we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, right? No, so how could this be a trap? Because if you're backslidden and suddenly you're facing the greatest trial, test, temptation of your life, that could be a trap, that could be a problem, that could be a snare that you don't want your foot getting caught in. So this is what he's talking about. Guard your hearts, make sure, be introspective, constantly be monitoring your own heart, being honest with yourself to make sure that you're not backslidden. And guys, we are all subject to this every single day. You and me, we need to guard our hearts because we lie to ourselves in so many different ways. So this is Paul's exhortation. Otherwise, that day will come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. Wait a minute, but our pre-trib brothers and sisters say this is for us. But here he's saying, no, it's going to come upon everyone. But we're not going to be part of it. Do you see what I'm saying? This is not a pre-tribulational support text. If you read the full context of it, you run into far greater problems. And then he goes on. He says, but keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape, praying that you have strength to endure, praying that you'll have strength to persevere without giving up, without quitting, without apostatizing, without denying Christ, without rejecting or leaving the faith. That is what Jesus said previous in Matthew 24, right? He says, at that time, many will leave the faith. How can you say that's for the Jews? They will leave the faith, but you'll be hated because of my name. Guys, the Olivet Discourse is for believers. It is for believers. It's absolutely for us. Here Jesus exhorts us, pray, guard your hearts, watch your hearts, watch your life. Make sure that you're not backslidden, that you're not self-deceived, that you're not bogged down, that you're not overwhelmed with the cares of this world, the attachments of this world. Because if you are, when this test comes, you might not be ready. And you might be among those who deny Christ and who leave the faith, the very ones that Jesus warned of. Guys, if it can happen to someone else, it can happen to you. Warnings are not just for other people. Warnings are for all of us. And so finally, I'm going to jump back. What is Jesus referring to when he says, pray that you will escape all these things? We're just going to jump back a few verses, beginning in verse 12, Luke 21, verse 12. Then they will lay hands on you, and they will persecute you. Skipping forward to verse 18. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated all because of my name. Guys, this is speaking to believers that will be persecuted, that will be hated because of the name of Jesus. And now look at this. He says, yet not a hair of your head will perish. And here's one of my all-time favorite verses. By your endurance... You will gain your lives. 
if we want to put an overarching verse over this entire series, the rapture and the endurance of the saints, by our endurance, we will save our lives. Notice the, contra the seeming oxymoron here. They will put you to death, but not a hair on your head will be hurt. What? You see, this is the thing. Oftentimes when Jesus speaks of deliverance, of escaping the particular time, he's not saying that you won't see it. He's saying that you'll get through it without damage to your soul. When he says not a hair of your head, he's using an expression. He's saying they'll kill you. But what is he saying? He's saying the same thing that he said elsewhere. Fear not those who can kill the body. Fear the one that can throw your body and soul into hell. He goes, so you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be hated, they'll even kill you, but don't worry, they can't hurt your soul. But pray, guard your hearts, watch your hearts, otherwise that day will come upon you like a trap and you won't be ready. But pray rather that you'll be strong enough, that you'll be counted worthy to escape that time with your souls, with your salvation intact. Amen. It's a good verse, it's a beautiful passage, um, but we cannot let our brothers and sisters distort and twist it to say something that it's not saying. It's exhorting us to prepare for the trials, for the storms that are coming, and in fact that are already here. So amen and amen. I trust that that was um, helpful and, as I said, brought clarity uh, to the text. I look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, God bless you all. Have a fantastic week. Maranatha.